So I'd like to welcome everyone. This is the third, I think, event in our series, Engineering in Action series. So I would like to welcome all of you. Thank you for being here. This is very important. You get to see us, we get to see you and brag about the things we do in the School of Engineering. So I would like to thank you all for being here. And uh, today, of course, we got Lydia Tapia. And I would like to, Dr. Lydia Tapia, Associate Professor from Computer Science. And I'd like to invite uh, Mariah to introduce uh, Dr. Tapia. Thank you, Dean Christodoulou. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you're having a beautiful Friday. Um, my name is Mariah Paiochi Lee. I'm a senior here at UNM studying chemical engineering. Um, it's my pleasure to be the host for today's Engineering in Action speaker series with Dr. Lydia Tapia. Uh, Dr. Tapia is an associate professor in computer science. Dr. Tapia has earned over $5 million in research and equipment funding and has also filed two patents, one on a novel unmanned aerial vehicle design and another on a method to design allergen treatments. Today, Dr. Tapia will share with us how her work in robotics, games, and artificial intelligence is impacting our community. Before we get started, I would like to mention we do have a time reserved at the end of a talk, at the end of the talk for a Q&A. So I encourage you to use the chat function for your questions. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lydia Tapia. Thank you, thanks Mariah. Uh, I'm really excited to be here with you guys. Um, it, I, not to break the, it's, I think it's like 15 million. It's closer to, yeah, triple. Exciting amount. Yeah, I was totally in it last week and I'm like, oh my God, that's a lot of money to spend. So <laughs> in a short amount of time. So I'm excited to be here with you guys. Um, we're gonna talk about um, some of the work going on from my lab, it's called the Tapia Lab, and we work on robotics, biology, and gaming applications. So that's why we're gonna talk about all of those things in the talk today. But I wanted to kick off by playing a little game that we played in AI class um, often this semester. And we're gonna play some music, and you get to guess which one is composed by the AI and which one is composed by a human. So we're just gonna do this really quick. This is one. Okay, and now here is clip two. Okay, so I am launching a poll. She should have launched ahead of time. And everybody on Zoom gets to vote. Um, and if you are watching on Facebook Live, feel free to comment or other things. I think we have somebody monitoring those comments as well. And I am gonna share the results of the poll while we are, I think people are still able to vote and change them, but oh, well, maybe not yet. Um, so you guys can see the poll results. Everybody, there was a little bit more that thought the first clip was made with AI and rather than the second one, but not that many people voted before I shared. So um, I can, um, I can relaunch, let's see. Oh, I guess that's, we'll let that go for a second before I tell you guys the answer in a second. So what I wanted to kick off is while you, you guys are voting, we're going to talk a little bit about all the things that have been in the news lately about how, how AI has been, being, has been used. So you've probably heard AI is doing things like curing cancer, right? Being able to recognize tumors, being able to um, find them faster and sooner. AI has been able to be used for um, cybersecurity predictions um, so that we can find threats and address them quickly. And AI has been used even to stop our bread from molding. Um, and even this week, there was a news story about how Google um, DeepMind has actually changed the game of protein folding, where they've been able to solve a structure in the recent um, protein design competition, where they get a sequence and they actually have to come up with this 3D structure of the protein. So um, that's what AI has been able to do. And now that I've given you guys actually time to vote, I'm going to show you guys the results and share it. So if you can see that, 34% um, thought clip one was made with AI, 42% um, thought clip two was made with AI, 
2% thought neither of them was, and 22% was thought both of them were. Um, so those that guessed that clip one was AI, you guys are correct. That is the one actually built for the neural network. And um, clip two was actually from the movie AI, not actually human composer for that. Oh, cool. I know, so AI is gonna be all around us and um, it's used for so many different problems in the world. Um, and we're gonna talk about some of those that we're addressing here at UNM today. So I get inspired by the future of the world by, you know, a lot of the things I watch on TV. Um, and, you know, probably growing up, this impacted me more. So I always think about what I thought the AI future would look like in terms of the TV I used to watch. Things like the bionic woman. This is the most amazing AI I used to watch because she had these amazing prosthetics. They worked seamlessly with her and they were smart on their own. They could regulate pressure, you know, do different things like lift a car or actually hug a kid, right? Um, other things that I used to watch, things like self-driving cars, you know, Kit from Knight Rider, that was an amazing AI system where um, it not only could drive itself in parallel park like the cars of today, but it also could um, think for itself and make big decisions as well. And you know, one of the old favorites, the Jetsons, right? They had amazing technology, even though it wasn't very socially aware. Um, the show showed us things like regulating, um, auto-regulating our exposure to um, environmental conditions, right? A lot of the pollution, so it was auto-regulating that. They had flying cars. And probably the best technology from the Jetsons was when he had to get up in the morning, right? Remember, he had to get up, it was so hard to get out of bed. And his bed would actually tilt him out and actually get him ready in the morning. So if you don't remember the Jetsons, he would get dressed and the robots would dress him in the morning, put on his shoes, brush his hair, and actually even brush his teeth for him. Now these are what we thought the future was gonna be like. Well, let's update and see what's actually been done since the Jetsons came out. Now we have robots that actually will dress us. This is being developed for disabled people so that um, we can smartly be able to take their arms and limbs that may not be functional and be able to put them in sleeves for them. Um, so this is actually being done right now. But even things like shoes, shoes are a pretty hard problem. And while it doesn't seem that hard, if you look at his high tops, they actually are pretty hard to twist and turn to get them onto his feet. So those are actually, that's the hard problem is not actually solved very well in AI right now. Hair brushing. Hair brushing um, is a very delicate um, problem, right? Because you have something, a robot coming next to your head. Um, this is one that's very hard to solve because of things like errors in the sensing, um, errors in uh, positioning, and you just don't want those types of errors near your head. And then tooth brushing's kind of got the same problem, just now the robot's going in your mouth, so you probably don't want that as well. Now you might think that there's surgical robots that can actually do these things, but they're actually doing very small decisions under very controlled circumstances. So they're really good at these problems. But if we're trying to do these you know, very fragile but larger motions, this is a really hard problem for AI. So I like to think about um, hard problems that we solve every day on campus at UNM. Um, and one thing that we used to do before COVID all the time, and you guys probably did this too, most of these people I see in here are faculty or students or alumni. And what we used to do is we would cross central to go to lunch, right? We'd run across, probably jaywalk across central. I know this is the wrong part of central, you guys recognize this is not by campus, but you know, we had, I had to find a picture of Central and it's further down. So we have to jaywalk across the street in order to get lunch, right? So this is a, you know, we don't seem to think it's very hard because we do it every day, but we actually wanted to simulate this in my lab to see how hard this problem really was. So we built a system where we could set up a road with some cars, car-like things going on it, and they would move stochastically, which means they could speed up or slow down. And this is a problem we can use AI to solve exactly. We can figure out if there is a route across this road there where we can go and not collide with a car, not, not have a car hit us. And 
what we did is we solved this problem exactly, and we found out that if we solved it exactly, that we were only successful 50% of the time, that we could only find a route 50% of the time where there was no collision for this street crossing problem that you see here. And then if we um, allowed the, the AI system to say, we can take some risk while you're crossing that street. I'll give you a 5% chance of risk or 1% or even chance of risk and see if you, um, you can find a route. Well, then it can actually find a route from 96 to 99% of the time. And just because we're now allowing the AI to find um, options where there's some chance of collision along that way. So while it may not seem like a very hard problem, it actually is a kind of a hard problem. And AI is having to accept this potential risk to find a solution. And it has a hard time tuning what that risk is that it needs to, to set. So we've actually implemented this in a system that we use in the lab. Um, it's a video game where you control a bee and you're trying to avoid these wasps, which are kind of like the cars in the other simulation. And what you see the red square on the screen is the human's finger controlling that bee, telling him where to go. And what we did is we actually set up this scenario and let people play the game and collaborate with automation to see if they could solve this problem. So what we saw was that under certain circumstances, let me go ahead and play this, that the bee had some tough choices. So here the bee is trying to get to this goal. The goal is the honeycomb. And he has to decide if he's gonna hit the gas and go to the honeycomb, or if he's gonna swerve and avoid this wasp that's coming into him. And so I wanna figure out if he should hit the gas or if he should swerve. So I'm gonna launch our poll and see what you guys wanna do. This is great. I'm watching the results as they're coming in. If you're on the Facebook Live, feel free to put it in the comments. If you watch this later, feel free to put it in the comments. Um, I'm always curious what people want to do. Um, I'll tell you what I would like to do. Um, I tend to be very cautious, so I actually would probably throw away. Um, we've got 80% voting, so I'm going to end the poll and share these results with you guys. So in our audience, we have some very um, risky drivers, which is probably why New Mexico streets are often kind of scary. We have 60% of the people saying that they would hit the gas, 23% um, saying they would swerve away like me. Okay, so let's see what the automation does. Let me just pull away. So the automation. Okay, here's the automation. Automation decides to swerve away and gets hit by a different boss never makes it to the goal. Let's see if you hit the gas. Hit the gas, that's the human finger right on the screen hitting the gas to accelerate him to the goal and he actually makes it. And I know we don't show the exact last frame when he gets onto the goal because we know it happens, we just record that it happens. So yes, I guess if you hit the gas in this situation, um, you will outplay the automation which is kind of interesting. Um, humans are actually better at some decisions than others, and maybe it's this risk-taking. This is one of the things we're looking into. But let's take a second and look into the brain of that bee and see why he actually made that decision that he made. So if we look into his brain, he's actually seeing something like this. Here he's navigating, the red dot in the middle is him knowing his position. And he's going along these blue bands, which means he's getting closer to the goal. He kind of knows that he's getting closer to his next goal. And he sees these things coming at him and he's got a feeling of what direction they're going and where they're gonna go. Well, it's an approximation feeling, but he can just use that to decide whether he's gonna swerve or go straight. And so that's why he's swerving. He's trying to get, um, keep it as safe as possible and avoid that collision, but it puts him in a worse situation later that he can't anticipate. So we've been thinking about these problems at UNM and in my lab in particular, and we've come up as a, as a faculty, we've been meeting and thinking about it, and come up with four main areas that AI is really not um, developed enough in to be able to be useful for different, um, really difficult scenarios. And those four areas are on this chart, 
and we call them data, safety, explainability, and resource constraints. And I'll walk you through these while we go through the talk today. So well, the first one we're gonna start thinking about is explainability. And that's how we can get humans and AI to work together. This is a pretty hard problem. Humans need to understand the AI. The AI needs to understand the humans. And they need to be able to collaborate to be able to use the best um, circumstances in the circumstance that they need. They need to use the best person for that job, person or AI. The second question is about safety. So how do we make sure AI is safe? Um, this is a pretty hard problem, which we're going to look into in a second. And data, um, how do we make deal with large amounts of complex data? So when we have a lot, we need a lot of data for this learning and often that data can um, have some issues with it as well. And the fourth one is resource constrained. So if we have a system that's very resource constrained, either power or computation, then we need to, it to still be able to make decisions and be able to learn things on the fly. So these are the four main challenges that we have now in AI systems. So let's start thinking about, we looked a little bit about how we make humans and AI um, work together, but let's look at um, how they can, um, if AI, how we can determine if AI is really safe. This is a really hard problem, but let's take our bee example for a second and look at that. So here's a wasp and he's moving in a line, straight line in a particular direction, in the direction of this arrow. And if we had to map out where he's going to be in the future, it might look something like this, where here's that red cone which will tell us where that wasp is probably going to be in, that, in the future. Well, this one, if you're an engineer, probably notice this guy's deterministic, so we know exactly where he'll be in the future. All of the blue dots are around him are the actions we can take, but out here, I don't care what action I take. Any action I take is not going to collide with that wasp. But up here in the front where there's arrows, there's certain actions I really should take so I don't collide with him. So those are the things that we know about this particular problem. Well, if we use learning to learn this problem, we actually learn an approximate model of what this wasp is doing. Something like this, where now our cone shape is still there, but it's a little noisy. And because it's learning, it likes to tell us what actions we take in every state. Some of these are um, the different actions we, it, likes, it prefers because it's just ranking them by score. And then up here, you notice that there's pretty good actions to say step away from that wasp or step out of its way, kind of like up here in this situation. But you might notice these arrows are actually a little bit different between these two things. Even though our AI learned system works about 99% of the time. So 99% of the time, it's not gonna collide with an obstacle. But still, we know that these arrows are a little bit different, especially right here, right in front. And I kind of like to think of this as um, the, like being in a horror movie and the monster is chasing right behind you and you're just going in front of it. Um, but these true solution says, well, step out of the way so it doesn't hit you. Our AI system says run away from it, right? Like they do in horror movies. But if you're in the horror movie and you're walking, running away from the, the monster, he usually moves slower than you. In this case, it's not gonna work because the wasp actually moves faster than you. So that's the problem <laughs> with this. So how do we actually, this is pretty hard to determine and we could do it for this problem, but how do we actually find these scenarios when our AI is actually not safe enough that it needs to be? This is kind of one of the questions we've been grappling with in the lab as well. So maybe we can make the learning work better. Maybe we can get a human to help. So these are the things we're trying to answer. So we're gonna see if we can make humans and AI work together better and see if we can do that in different types of problems. So we've done this, we've looked at this um, for, the defend, for this problem we call the defensive team problem, where it actually came to me when I was walking in the airport and it's really crowded and you want to get to your gate, but there's a lot of people in the way and everybody bumps you. Wouldn't it be really nice if your luggage would follow along with you and kind of guide the way and clear the way for you? I know it's probably not the most polite, but, and if everybody had the system, it probably wouldn't work that well, but you know, go with me for a second. You could also, you think of it as parents walking with their child, they kind of do this escorting type behavior as well. Or you could think of it for a convoy of vehicles, um, where maybe you're, the convoy of vehicles is trying to go somewhere and they need these defensive escorts to clear the way for them as well. So we came up with this um, scenario where we could test this type of problem. 
where you have a system where we have our payload or our moving um, important cargo that we're trying to move from one point to another point. Around it, we wanna keep a defensive region clear just so we can feel better about how safe we're keeping that payload. We have things like um, goals, so our payload's trying to get somewhere. And then our escorts are the things keeping it safe. So those are those blue dots here on the screen. And each of those only can't see the whole world at the same at, at a time. So they each have their own sensing radius where it can only see what's going around, on around it. And we have these moving obstacles around it um, that we're, these are the things we're trying to keep our payload safe from. So this is the scenario we set up. We can use AI to solve this problem. And it looks something like this. So we have our payload, here's in gold, moving towards a goal. It's got these escorts automatically placing it themselves around that payload and moving so they can push those obstacles out of the way so our payload can make it safe to the goal. So let me show you what this system could do because this surprised us. Once we learned it, this problem, it actually we found it was very robust to different scenarios. So for this particular scenario, we're losing an agent halfway through and we gained it back. So this is gaining it back. And our, you'll notice that the escorts actually figure out how to place themselves without being told explicitly around that payload so they can better protect it. They also automatically learn where to go to intercept those moving obstacles. Um, and so our payload is actually able to make it safely to the goal, even in really crowded scenarios. So we can even handle things like if our payload changes shape. I know this sounds weird and we implemented it in a kind of a weird fashion. We just made the circle expand and, and contract. But you could think of it if it's a convoy of vehicles, it could change from a line to a kind of a more circular shape to other types of shapes. And as long as that payload doesn't transform too fast, faster than our escort can actually adapt to it, then they can actually place themselves automatically just by sensing that the payload has changed shape. So this was pretty exciting. Learning could be very robust to these types of changes in scenario. But let's look into the brain of one of these agents and see why it's making those decisions. So this, we did look into that brain of that agent. This is kind of what we would see. You know, it looks really weird, but the colors really tell us something about what it's thinking. You'll notice we have blue and red, red regions like this are bad regions for it to go. That's what it's rating really bad. So this, you can think of this as like a plane where looking down at what the agent, if it was looking down at the world, what it might see. And red ones are really bad areas. Blue areas are really good areas. It really wants to go there. We have things like, this is the payload drawn on, so we can see it. The, the escort doesn't actually see the payload. It just knows that something's there. And it sees, um, and so you see the blue is kind of around that, and especially around the cordon region here, um, that's where it's blue. And then here are the other escorts that it sees as well. Um, and we're just drawing those in so you can see them. And so really it's able to recognize automatically without being told the size of the cordon region, just that the cordon region is something to be protected it can tell that that's a good place for it to be. It likes to be in the cordon region because that's what it's gonna do to keep that payload safer. What else you're gonna see is that it likes to be, this is a little bit darker blue than the rest of the blue on here. And it likes to be spread out from the other agents. So he, he thinks it's better for him to be spread out than to be close to another agent. And that makes sense as well. And he's also knowing where the bad places to be are. So here's a moving obstacle. And he realizes if he goes behind a moving obstacle, he's probably gonna repel it and push it right into the, to the cordon region. But if he could go in front of it right here where it's blue, that's actually not a too bad place to go. So this is kind of what our agent is thinking while he's uh, making those decisions about um, where he should move to next. So if we start thinking about these problems, and especially about thinking about how we can get humans and AI to work together, well, so far we've been talking about how we can understand what that agent is thinking. But let's think about for a second now how we can make them work together. Well, when we try to test these um, autonomous systems and humans interacting together, 
typically they're in very expensive setups where you have a physical mock-up of a car or a VR, big VR system, and humans can interact with that automation and they can figure out how to best interact together. Well, we want to do this cheaply and easily and in a, in a system where we can just adapt it really quickly and someone else and trust out a new interface. So we did this within that game that you saw before where humans can interact with the automation. And what we saw is that humans playing this game actually interacted with the automation in different ways. So some of them like to take control and some of them like the automation to take control more than others. So that was pretty interesting as well. But we also gave them a survey because we wanted to figure out how biased are people towards AI and automation. And so I'm gonna see before we release what they said, I wanna see what you guys think. We're gonna launch this poll on two questions about automation. So the first question is, would you like to have a self-driving car take you home from work? And then you guys get to answer yes or no. And the second question is, would you trust an automated bus to drive your kids to school? And the, question, the, the answers are going up and down. I'm like seeing people respond. Okay, we've got 75% voting, 80%. Cool. I know I'm favoring those that make decisions quickly. 88. We got a lot of response on this. This is pretty cool. Okay, I'm going to share it. So what we have is for question one, would you like to have a self-driving car take you home from work? 83% said yes. And that's actually pretty comparable. I'll show you the results from our survey as well. And would you like to, would you trust an automated bus to drive your kids to school? 51% said yes. And I actually think I biased that result with this talk already. So um, we'll see. I'm gonna show you guys what the, the people in our user study said. So 91% said they would enjoy having a self-driving car take them home from work. And 63% agreed that they would like an automated bus to drive them home from school. Well, knowing what now, I did bias you guys a little bit because I talked about safety before we got to this point. So maybe your results are a little bit different, but it's pretty common. Um, people are really ready for automation and really ready to work with it. So we actually wanted to see what would happen if they actually were involved in a collision when the automation was driving and when they were driving. Would their behavior actually change and would they start to use automation more or less? So with this experiment, we actually saw um, if before an accident and after an accident, whether or not they would use automation less or more. And this is for a user under control. So when a user collided, they tended to want to use automation more um, so that because they were caused that collision and they tended to want to use that automation a little more. When the automation collided, it's not super surprising. They actually wanted to use the automation a little bit less, but it wasn't as substantial as when they had then the user actually caused the collision and that change happened. But why, why were they still so trusting of automation? Or why were they having such a hard time collaborating with that automation to actually work well? Well, we found out from that study that they actually had a hard time understanding what that automation was gonna do. So it was difficult to trust it. So even when it collided, it was hard to trust it again. And it kind of didn't, it was hard to run, it, it, they said it was um, ran against their sense of control. So they didn't know exactly what it was gonna do. We also wanna know under what circumstances they felt they really should take over from the automation. So they would told us in their survey studies that the, when there was a lot of obstacles around, when they felt the problem was too hard for them, they wanna just hand it to the automation. And we saw that as well. So our game had three levels of increasing difficulty. On the first is in the top plot. And the second level medium obstacles is in the middle plot. And very hard problem was in the bottom plot. And what we noticed is that people tend to just use the automation a lot more when there were a lot of obstacles around. So they want the automation to actually solve those hard problems for them. But in the user results, we saw some surprising things. One was the thing we've already talked about, where humans could actually outperform the automation in some cases. That was that scenario where they hit the gas instead of swerving away. In other cases, they could actually prevent, um, oh, that, the, this is the one where they prevent the collision with a little bit of input, so they're swerving away. But then they can, so the other scenarios and they outperform. And I'm gonna show you those two. So 
This is the um, human automation assistant you saw before. So the human hits the gas and reaches the goal. And this is the swerve away scenario. There you go. And he actually collided. Every time he swerved away, he collided for every user in the study. And then for this scenario, the player actually outperformed the automation and getting to the goal faster, which we found surprising because automation really knows where those goals are and, and likes to get to them as fast as possible. But what we found is that the human user found a different route. And see right here, he picked up the yellow and now this one's picking up the yellow later. The automation is picking up the yellow later. So the route that the human found was actually shorter than the route that the human, than the automation found. So that was pretty exciting too. So there are things that humans do a lot better and we have to figure out how to make the automation and the humans work better together. So I wanna talk about one more scenario where we have a lot of data and we have to figure out how to deal with a lot of that data for these problems. And this data is pretty hard to procure because it has to do with molecules. Um, molecules are moving and interacting together. This is the same molecule in two different formats. You can see where all the atoms are on the right and the surface of it um, on here on the left. And this is actually an HIV-1 protease. Um, and what it does is that it um, makes, helps the HIV uh, molecules rep or virus replicate and become active. And so there, it's a popular drug target because you could design drugs to fit in this little hole and then stop the HIV protease from functioning. There's a few drugs already developed, but a lot of them have side effects. So they're often looking for different drugs to interact um, with this molecule so they can stop HIV from replicating. So here is um, what we did. We took that uh, molecule and we put it in a video game where people can actually take the, um, what we're testing out as the inhibitor and test how it might interact with that larger HIV-1 molecule, uh, HIV protease molecule. And so the human can interact and um, sample that space. And the reason why we want the human to do it rather than automation by itself is because automation has a hard time because the space is so large. And humans can see things like where the hole is or um, feel things like what energy is um, returned by the, that interaction of the two molecules. And so humans can help use their tactile sensors and their visual sensors to figure out how best those fit together and they can sample that space better and maybe do it um, easier and faster than automation. So we've built this game and had players come into the lab, um, actually play it. And when they're playing the game, it looks something like this. You'll notice the background is actually at the duck pond on the UNM campus. Um, we did that because we wanted to duck molecules at the duck pond. I know it's a silly pond. And here you have your molecules. Um, you can move your molecules and look around. And you can do things like uh, move them and you'll get different interaction energies. These will actually translate into vibrational feedback on the phone. So you can use that to guide your solution. Um, so if you're going to a bad solution, it'll vibrate a lot. If you're going to a good solution, it won't uh, vibrate. Um, we've actually done this with haptic sensors in the lab, so you can actually feel those forces of interaction as well. And then when people play, it looks something like this. This is the data we get back from people playing. So here you have that HIV-1 protease molecule in the middle in gray. And the green is three different um, interactions that we saw from people playing with the game. So people like to explore different spaces. You'll notice this player here on the bottom um, like to explore just one side of the molecule. Some people explore all around. Some people like to go um, deeper into the surface like this. Um, so there's a lot of different strategies that people can, can take. We can actually combine this with automation and figure out how we can um, find routes now um, for those two molecules to interact. And if we do that, it actually looks something like this, where this green all around is the combination, it's probably hard to see on the video, but it's a combination of everybody's data all put together. And then we can search, um, use AI to search for routes from one state to another to figure out how it might get into different dock states. And so here's a low energy state on the surface that it likes to go to, and we can find routes to that as well. So we've talked about humans and AI working together, safety, large amounts of data, 
Um, as a computer scientist, I tend to prefer to have lots of computational power, so I don't tend to work in the fourth area very much, but I can tell you about one of the problems that we've addressed that actually will highlight what the problems of resource constraint may be. So this is a collaboration that we worked on with Google. So this is actually on the third floor of one of the buildings at Google, and this is Google's fetch robot navigating down that corridor. And what he's done with his AI is figure out how to avoid these obstacles while they're moving in front of him automatically and find these long range routes, even though he has really noisy sensors that are guiding him. That's kind of why he seemed jitter quite so much. And so um, he's actually able to do all that computation on the fly because he actually has lots of computational power um, to be able to do that and also um, can talk to the local network to figure out things like maybe where he is, where the goal is, things like that. Well, in a resource constrained environment, you wouldn't have that information. Um, that onboard computing may be very minimal. You also may not have information about where you are. So these are kind of some of those uh, issues that you might see in resource constraint scenarios. So we've been thinking about a lot about this a lot at UNM and as a product of um, CS and ECE, we just led a proposal to NSF for an AI Institute here at UNM. So this AI Institute is a collaboration of um, eight academic partners, or actually nine academic partners and two DOD research labs and um, five national labs. I'm gonna get those numbers right. I have to keep it straight in my head. And also quite a few businesses and educational partners as well. Well, we don't know if we'll get the funding for this AI Institute, but we're really excited to um, coalesce these ideas and these researchers together and to see where AI takes UNM uh, in the future as well. So this work that you saw on the talk was not the product of just me. This was actually my research lab. Um, amazing postdocs and students that have done great work in my lab and students that have gone on um, to Google and um, SimTable and Sandia National Labs. So I'm happy to take your questions um, as, we, um, as we wrap up. Great, thank you for sharing your work with us, Dr. Tapia. Um, so as mentioned, we will start the question and answer portion now. Um, you can use the chat function to submit your questions and that's located there, located there on the bottom of your uh, Zoom window. Um, so we do have a couple questions to get the ball rolling here. What emerging applications of, of AI do you see for everyday work-life tasks, Dr. Tapia? <laughs> I know, right? It's changed a lot because we're all working from home now. Um, so uh, we were, uh, I was thinking about this a bit lately. I do know, um, I think you can take the hardest problems you have that you deal with on a daily basis and come up with some AI tool that is yet to be developed for those. So um, Google's been trying to do this with our email for a while, where I, th I find email to be one of the banes of my existence, right? And so you have to have so much to reply to, so much to do. And being able to do these automatic replies, they're actually scanning to figure out like how, what phrases should I use to reply? Um, even things like, and I don't know if they're doing this yet, but things like taking your own language and figuring out what your standard replies are and customizing those replies to you. This would be very, an easy task for, for an AI system. Um, I could see this, um, we use this every day. Um, our navigation skills are amazing because of AI. So I think we've gotten things like Google Maps is all predicting what traffic patterns and traffic routes will be. Um, I think that's gonna get even more seamlessly integrated into our lives so that we can figure out what's the best route to get somewhere once we get to travel outside our houses again. Um, things like, you know, I'm, there's been a huge advance in um, online inventories um, due to COVID. So now that stores wanna put all their stuff on for sale online, this will be, um, this is super advantageous for anybody that wants to do different types of marketing type things. So we've got a lot of this already for different, um, for like Amazon and like Netflix will tell us, recommend what to watch, but you're gonna see it in the grocery stores. You're gonna see it um, kind of everywhere you go. 
Um, it also help um, figure out, um, because this was always a hard problem when we were trying to figure out where people wanted to shop in the malls, because you'd have to figure out where people are walking to and what stores they prefer. Now it's pretty easy. We can just track web traffic and figure out where people want to go and what they're looking at to try to recommend things. So we're going to see, see seamless AI integration into almost every aspect. All right, yeah. Um, when you said that, I thought of um, when I do like a Walmart grocery pickup, like mm -hmm. it'll, you know, like recommend to me, like, do you want this? Or like, hey, you got like Oreos before, are you sure you don't want it again or something? And <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's going to be even worse. It's going to be like, you had a bad week. You want Oreos again, right? <laughs> 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 All right. Um, the next question, uh, what keeps you up at night thinking on AI? I do worry about, um, about the, I do worry about the, um, this, the speed at which things are getting put into production. So um, I, I spent some time at, at Google a while back and one of my, some of my good friends work at Waymo and such. And the, the semis are not bad. I think it's freeway driving is not, too hard of a problem. It's really easy to lane follow and kind of stay in a direction. But city driving is pretty hard. So I do worry about the speed at which these things are getting pushed into production and released without really thinking about these safety considerations of the thing as well. So that's probably the biggest thing that worries me, is just to take a step back and really understand what it means for the safety um, and usability of these things. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Um, so we have a question from um, Amber. She asks, what research has Dr. Tapia done with allergies? <laughs> so we used, um, we showed HIV-1 protease, but the other molecule we use a lot in these um, haptic studies is a, um, a immunoreceptor. So it'll recognize different molecules in the system and try to um, see if they, um, if it recognizes it or if they can fit into that immunoreceptor. So we've also looked at um, antibody aggregation. So it's another really high dimensional complex problem where you have to um, figure out how antibodies are gonna link up together to form a complex structure. So that's another of the problems we've looked at. Um, that we need to use AI to solve that problem because it's so complex. We're also trying to figure out how do you employ some of that human intuition into guiding the AI as well for that problem. Okay. Um, let's see, we have another question from Mary. She asks, how can undergraduates interested in machine learning um, and AI get started in learning about them? Um, so, uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of popular reading you can do for AI. You know, I really love the, you know, I'm so algorithmic. I really love the CS route through it because it's a very nice way. So I'll recommend that you get a CS degree and, and take lots of AI and machine learning. I do like that route because it does tell us a lot about, um, makes you think about the computational complexity and the complexity of those different problems and really understand in depth about how those problems be solved. But that's just my preference. I think to be functional in AI and implement things, you don't need as much. You can do online courses, um, which will teach you just how to implement, how to test different things. Um, and, you know, some, a lot of it's straightforward into different types of programming packages, so you can do that as well. Okay. Um, Dr. Pyle asks, can you recommend a VR heads or system to use in a remote mm -hmm. classroom environment, both AR and VR experiences, remote labs, he says. <laughs> so, um, I actually have not worked in um, VR in quite a few years. Um, what I was starting to use was the Google Daydream, which they completely just discontinued, so I would not recommend that. But I know there's some cheap systems out there that um, work really well. Um, so. so yeah, I would just kind of look at what's um, popular and cheap for that particular type of system because um, the technology gets discontinued quite regularly. Okay, um, Ramiro asks, how can AI be used to build trust, a value that we <laughs> Yeah, so trust is um, used quite a bit in the terminology of this, um, this usability area. And the idea is that trust is something that we can measure. You know, that's the hope. 
because everything on here is some sort of optimization. We're trying to optimize getting to the goal. We're trying to optimize avoiding obstacles. We're trying to optimize keeping that payload safe. So it'd be great if we could just figure out a value where we can optimize trust. But trust is actually a really hard thing to, um, to measure and actually figure out like what percentage of trust do you have in that automation. And that can change also while you're interacting with it, right? If it crashes or does other things. So one of the things we're really trying to explore uh, is how do we get information about that from that AI, complex AI system and hand that back to the human? Because then they can actually understand what they're interacting with. Because that's part of the problem. That's really like what the trust is, is if I don't understand what you're doing, even if I don't like it, at least I know what you're doing. And so I can decide when to take over for them. There's a lot of um, work in that I have sort of idea of how teams work. So teams may not always work in the same way, individuals on the team, but as long as the teammates understand what they're doing, they can actually uh, work together well. So that's what we're looking at for this. Okay, and I think that kind of leads into our next question from Isaac. He asks, uh, what is one of the biggest hurdles for the advancement in AI right now? Yeah, um, I think it's growing on every front. Um, things like that Google study with the proteins. Um, you see things like the solving the protein folding problem. We have things like we publish papers all the time. We've done defender teams. We've done um, quad rotors. We've done um, ship um, automated ship movements. Um, so there's a lot of different applications. But I think what the AI community really needs is to take a step back and look at these fundamental problems of AI, things like the usability, the safety, um, what we really do with these hard data problems. That protein folding, that protein folding problem that Google solved this week, it's not a hard data problem. The hardest part of that problem is figuring out what features to make out of that data in order to solve that problem. And then they throw a lot of data, a lot of compute time at that problem in order to find the solution. So these are the things that are easy. We're going to throw resources at it, data, um, throw a memory, computation time. But when those start getting pulled away, those are the hardest problems in AI to solve. Okay. Um, Steffi asks, do you think there needs to be new laws enacted to protect consumers? <sighs> <laughs> I love doing the research. I'm not a very political person. So I do think um, as consumers, we have to be informed and, and safe. So things like, um, I know I saw Elsa's comment in the chat to everyone that, um, that she wouldn't necessarily trust the bus for her kids. I mean, this, these are things you have to know. You wouldn't just say like a bus shows up at my house. I'm going to put my kids on it. I'm going to an automated bus. I'm gonna know how that is selected. Like we know the bus drivers go through some rigorous testing protocols. We know that different things happen before kids get on that bus nowadays. But if it's automation, we should still do the same thing. We should understand how that automation works. We should understand how it reacts to different scenarios. So those are the things I think we, we as consumers need. And I don't know how that translates into laws. I haven't thought about that too much. Right. Um... Kim asks, how is AI being used to fight the COVID pandemic? <laughs> I think I had had it in a talk before. There is a headline about AI um, for COVID. One of the biggest things I think that was pretty amazing is uh, that they right away when COVID hit, um, a group, I think it was out of the UK, put out an app where people who were experiencing symptoms or not experiencing symptoms, they would just download the app and every day put in how they were feeling. And then if they got diagnosed with COVID, they would say that they got a COVID test. And they actually used that to mine what um, symptoms tended to be associated with COVID. So some of those early results that came out about like sense of smell being an ish, um, being one of the big symptoms to, to recognize um, as COVID, as potentially COVID. Those were some of the things that came out of that early work. There's a lot of work in terms of um, looking at the structure of COVID and how we can design treatments to it. Um, so a lot of um, different uh, molecules that might interact um, to stop COVID from replicating, things like that that um, can be tested as well and, and are being tested with AI. Right. Um, Chad asks, do you know how close we are to having emotionally aware AI? 
<laughs> so yeah, that's really, that's a very interesting. I always like to tell um, emotions in AI, emotionally aware is definitely a very good term. But, so it's hard for AI to really recognize except for what we program into it. So they always say like what data you give it in is depends on what's coming out. And so it's kind of hard for it to be emotionally aware, but there are some interesting findings in the AI community about what really makes people think that, you know, I work in robotics primarily, what robots emotionally aware. So things like um, robots um, kind of not joking with you. So telling a joke is not an emotionally aware robot or making you laugh. But things like um, robots that may help rehab patients and figuring out um, that if you cheat on your exercises, the robot shouldn't just be calling you out on that or making a joke about it or whatever. They should actually let you cheat. And then next time you do an exercise, say, do 10 of these, but this time no cheating. That's really where those robots and the humans start to become, um, have like a more emotional connection and, and find humor in these things. So I think that's kind of funny. Um, but it's, this is the things that are trying to figure out how, what kind of responses tend to make those robots seem more emotionally aware. Okay. Um, we have a, another question from Steffi. She says, in the last two meetings of the New Mexico te Tesla Club, we have been discussing how scared we are by sudden braking in the autopilot mode and there is no feedback from Tesla. We have been in scary situations. This has been going on for over a year. Doesn't a company have a responsibility to inform their customers about why these kind of glitches might be happening? Stubby. <laughs> I would not use the autopilot. So, so, so the, the problem is, um, it's not that they, they have a, it's really, right now it's all driven by who's going to buy what. So all this technology is being pushed because everybody needs to be the first one out with a self-driving car that people can buy and have it as a reasonable price. Um, this is where I do believe the AI community really just needs to take this step back and be able to say, this is the safety guarantee. This is what I know is going to happen. That way you could know why it's breaking in certain situations. I will not, I will say it's not just Tesla. Even the Waymo car um, tends to break suddenly, um, swerve away suddenly. Um, it could be a sensor glitch. It could be, um, they're pretty good at handling the sensors, but it could just be that they see something in the way and they have to stop and they have to be, they're probably erring on the safe side, just like the automation is um, that we saw. So that's kind of what's going on there. And um, and right now, the only power since, and maybe the <laughs> because there's really no regulation on it. I mean, there's some, you know, they've got, um, but, but not much. And so they really have to, um, it's really driven by the consumers and what the consumers will buy and what they're trying to rush out. Okay, I think we have another question from Daniel. He says, do you think we've left the age of uh, causality and theories and are on a path towards an age of correlation where we just trust an AI to understand some phenomenon enough to suggest a cause of action? <laughs> That's a very complex question. I think we are on a we are we have so much reliance on on we have so much trust in automation right now you kind of see in our survey that people are ready for this technology they want it to use they want to make their lives better through ai technology this is great we want to foster that um those ideas because we want ai to really make our lives better that's kind of why we have enhancing a dynamic world we want to make the world better what is um what's no, I don't think that that's a bad thing. I think we just need to, you know, monitor it and be able to say, what are the guarantees? How can we work with the AI better? So those are the things we need to really um, be able to answer for those. Okay. Um, well, I think that um, ends our <laughs> minutes of question. Um, thank you, everyone, for... Please skip your question, Christos. <laughs> <laughs> I had an answer for your question. <laughs> I think it's a comment. Um, sorry. Um, sorry. <laughs> so, no, you're good. Um, so be on the lookout um, for our next Engineering Action Talk um, in 2021. 
And right now I'm going to share my screen to share with you guys um, another fun virtual event that's starting here just in a little. So let me share that really quick. Thank you. Here we go. It is the uh, STEM celebration. So that's happening here starting at four. Um, I can uh, post the Zoom link in the chat for those who are interested. Um, I'll just leave this here for just a little. Um, you can also find it at uh, UNM, or I'm sorry, ess.unm.edu um, events, and then you go to December to find that. Um, so yes, did I stop sharing? Yes, you stopped sharing. Okay, great. Well, uh, thank you again, everybody, um, for attending thank today. Uh, stay safe. Happy holidays. And of course, go Lobos. Bye-bye. <laughs>